Welcome all of you. My name is Giorgio Crediti and I am leading the Department of Energy Technologies and Renewable Energy Source of ENEA, Italian National Agency for New Technologies, Energy and Sustainable Economic Development. Welcome to all the distinguished speakers and participants of the second international symposium on cultural heritage preservation and restoration using advanced ICT technology co-organized by A3, Korean Electronics and Telecommunication Research Institute, ENEA, National Agency for New Technologies, Energy and Sustainable Economic Development, Italy, and NAC, Korea National University of Cultural Heritage and Fraunhofer, Germany. So uh, just uh, communication due to an unforeseen event, um, due to an institutional commitment, the ENEA president will join us later, but he should reach us in time for his speech. Now, um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce the co-chair of the, of the event, Mrs. Maya Kim, principal researcher in ATRI and now policy officer, national contact point for European Union and Korea relationships. Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Graditi. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Graditi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maya Kim working for ETRI. I thank you for all your participation to this symposium. And I'd like to express my special gratitude for your patience to combat COVID and finally be safe and healthy. First of all, on behalf of ETRI, I sincerely appreciate INEA team for their active support and preparation work for this event. Now, before we call on welcome messages of our, of our leaders, uh, let me briefly review the history and background of this symposium. The whole story goes back to 2018 when President of South Korea, Moon Jae-in, visited Rome to meet a mini Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte. At the summit meeting, the two leaders agreed to upgrade the country's relationship to strategic partnership. Among the agenda of science and technology cooperation between the two countries, the theme of cultural heritage uh, preservation and disaster management, management using the advanced ICT technology was adopted. Next page, please. Yes, and uh, two months later, at that year, 2018, NEA and ETRI signed an MOU for research collaboration in cultural heritage preservation and disaster management. And the next year, April 2019, we held the first symposium in Korea for the event, actually, six researchers from Italy visited Korea and also two scientific attaché in, in Italian embassy in Seoul also attended. It was the whole three-day event, uh, which was held in Atri and uh, Nucci National University of uh, Cultural Heritage and also the, in Seoul, uh, the, the, the hub of Korean cultural heritage. So uh, these are some pictures that was taken in that year. Uh, Italian ambassador, he himself gave opening uh, speech at the Seoul meeting. And the, the bottom picture is taken in every seminar room after the symposium. And also the right one is taken at the, in front of the gate, we call it the national treasury number one cultural heritage number one of Korea, Sung Ye Moon. And 2020, last year, September, the, the same month as, as is now, we held um, first international symposium. You know, it didn't take long for us to find out that Italy is not just only a beautiful country to travel, 
but also a very nice partner for research cooperation. And our friendship builds year by year. So when we made this first international symposium online because of the COVID pandemic, it was not just between Italy and Korea, but it became international beyond Italy and Korea. These are some snapshots that was taken last year. As you can see, the um, Italian peninsula with the, the, the disaster management system and also some of the pictures uh, of Korea uh, in which uh, IoT sensors are attached and the cultural heritage sites. Now, in 2021, we we are together again for this second international event. As you will see, this year it becomes more inclusive of researchers from other countries with diverse research backgrounds. Today, I wish you all have the opportunity to share the state of the art and to find insights for more advanced way of cultural heritage management. And next year, spring 2022, it will be continued. By the time I hope this pandemic will terminate and when we can be all free, we shall meet in Rome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya, for this great overview and for the message you provided aim to further strengthen our collaboration. Thanks again. Now it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Mr. Gilberto Dialuce, President of Enea, that will provide his greetings to the symposium and a brief overview on any activities related to research and development of ICT technologies and services provision in the area of culture, heritage, preservation and restoration. I give the floor to Enea President. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, dear presidents, dear participants. It's a pleasure for me to introduce this uh, very important meeting. And following the success uh, of the first symposium that was held last year in September 2020, this today event will be an opportunity for strengthening the collaborations among the participating institutions towards cultural heritage preservation and restoration. Enea is a long-lasting uh, uh, and internationally recognized record of research, development, and service provision in the sector of technologies for the safeguarding of cultural heritage and for its valorization directed to a wider range of stakeholders. Towards this goal, Enea has systematized the number of skills scattered in its research centers, widely spread in all Italy and departments, also building on technologies developed as part of different areas of research and development, including, among other, nuclear research, civil engineering seismic diagnostic, complex system analysis, and successfully customizing these technologies and know-how to cultural heritage preservation and restoration. To provide some examples, Enea is working now on developing ad hoc technologies to support the resilience and enhancement of cultural heritage to natural and man-made hazards. Cultural heritage stores societal history and identity and drives local economies. Despite that, because uh, the cultural heritage is still highly vulnerable to natural hazards, including earthquakes that can cause severe impacts and valuable losses. Enea, by the Department of Energy Technologies and Renewable Energy Sources, with the Laboratory for the Analysis and Protection of Critical Infrastructure, is coordinating the development of ICT platform, referred to as SIEP, CAST Decision Support System, to support the planning and implementation of strategies that can enhance the resilience of historic areas and there include the cultural heritage to extreme events. Enea, by the nuclear department participates in European initiatives in European research infrastructure for heritage science, led by the Italian National Council for Research, where INEA actively collaborates with the cultural heritage network of the Italian National Institute for Nuclear Physics and specifically participates with CISON 
portable field instrumentation for training initiatives, mobile system based on laser scanners available on our research center of Frascati close to Rome, and shaking tables for dynamic tests in our research center of Casaccia close to Rome. Moreover, Enea participates in technological dispute cultural heritage and activities for Lazio region in Italy, the World Street Technology Transfer Project, the first one for cultural heritage diagnostic and monitoring, the second one for seismic mitigation activities, and the last one for the creation of a digital collection platform and dedicated data management related to development of specific data use functions. As part of its international scientific and technological cooperation activities, Enea established a memorandum of understanding on December 9, 2018 with ATRI to promote the development of ICT technologies for the protection and conservation of cultural heritage and related technology transfer activities. In the framework of this MOU, several successful cooperation activities can be counted. For example, ENEA and ITRI are collaborating in the project the planning of international joint research to develop disaster prevention and response technology for cultural heritage heritage using ICT technology, funded by the National Research Council of Science and Technology of South Korea. ENEA has facilitated ETRI's participation as a third country in the ongoing ambitious European-funded project RISO 2020, led by the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft of Germany, where ENEA is a main partner. ENEA and ITRI are collaboratively working on Horizon Europe research proposal. And the former scientific attaché of the Embassy, Professor Canganella Francesco, who participated in the first symposium, informed us that the research and development sector applied to cultural heritage in the Italy Korea cooperation has been the one providing most satisfaction in recent years. Considering all the above, I am pleased to inform you that both INEA and ATRI have agreed on the renewal of the, this MOU until December 2024. I wish you a, fruit, a fruitful meeting and thanks for your attention. Thank you, President of ENEA, for your precious remarks. Now, thank you for ENEA, President, for your precious remarks. Now, for Korean leaders, there are two messages we have. First of all, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Myung Jun Kim, the president of ATRI, for his congratulatory remarks. I am Kim Myung Jun, president of Electronics and the Telecommunications Research Institute. They call it ATRI. It is my great honor to invite you to the very second international symposium on disaster prevention using information and communication technology, ICT, to preserve the cultural heritage to be held online due to COVID-19. As you may already know, active convergence in research using ICT across numerous fields have been happening in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. In particular, it is going to be such a valuable effort to use ICT towards preservation of cultural heritage field as well as the disaster prevention. I hope that the International Symposium will be an opportunity to discuss strategy that would benefit both Korea and Europe and looking forward for the cooperation of excellence in preservation and restoration technologies of European cultural heritage with Korea's leading ICT. Moreover, I wish that the, the exchange of exports from Korea and Europe will contribute to the advancement of conservation and restoration technology toward the fields of 
cultural heritage and the academic achievement for all of you. I, I would like to thank all the speakers for their hard work as well as Italy, ENEA, for the biggest support and cooperation. Special thanks go to Fraunhofer for allowing uh, ETRI to participate in ARC project. I also thank the Korea National University of Cultural Heritage and ETRI for their support. Finally, I hope that every attendee for this event would overcome the COVID-19 wisely and stay healthy. And may International Academic Symposium be the opportunity to share the camaraderie. Thank you. Thank you, President Myung Jun Kim. Now uh, we have a second message from Korea. Please welcome Dr. Young Mo Kim, the president of NUCH, Korea National University of Cultural Heritage. 안녕하십니까? 한국전통문화대학교 총장 김영호입니다. 오늘 개최되는 제2회 ICT 관 문화재 방제 국제 심포지움에 참석해 주신 한국과 유럽의 발표 및 토론자 여러분, 그리고 내빈 여러분을 진심으로 환영합니다. 우리 대학은 문화재 보존 관리 활용을 담당할 미래 인재와 전통 문화를 계승할 전문의 장소를 목표로 하고 있는 국내 유일의 대학입니다. 또한 국내는 물론 해외의 여러 연구기관과의 협업을 통하여 다양한 문화유산 R&D 사업을 수행하고 있으며 이를 기반으로 문화재의 미래 창출에 힘쓰고 있습니다. 오늘의 심포지움은 우리나라 문재인 대통령의 2018년 10월 유럽 방문 중 한국과 이탈리아 정상의 공동 언론 발표문이 기기가 되었습니다. 양국 정상은 이 발표문에서 문화재 분야의 국제 교류를 확대하고 신규 공동 연구 사업을 발굴 및 확대하자는 의지를 표명하였습니다. 포괄적인 공동 사업의 일환으로 지난 2019년 제1회 국제 심포지움이 개최되었고 이번 제2회에는 우리 한국전통문화대학교와 한국전자통신연구원이 공동으로 행사를 개최하게 되었습니다. 기후변화와 코로나 팬데믹은 우리의 생존과 지구 환경을 위협하고 있습니다. 특히 급격한 기후변화는 자연유산의 심각한 위기로 다가오고 있으며 지진, 홍수, 해일의 자연재해와 인간의 실수로 일탈된 행동에서 비롯되는 인적재해는 소중한 세계적인 문화유산이 소멸되는 상황으로 이어지고 있습니다. 이러한 전 지구적인 상황의 변화는 이제 문화유산의 보존과 관리에도 새로운 시도와 접근을 요구하고 있습니다. 4차 산업혁명의 기반인 ICT 기술을 활용한다면 인재와 자연재해를 사전에 예측하여 효율적으로 예방이 가능할 것입니다. 또한 재난 이후에도 빅데이터를 활용한 효율적인 대처로 문화유산의 현실을 최소화할 수 있을 것으로 기대합니다. 오늘 이 자리에서는 오랜 시간 동안 문화유산 재난방제 빅데이터 수집과 관리, 분석 기술을 축적해온 세계적인 연구 기관들이 함께하는 자리입니다. 그동안의 연구 성과를 공유하고 새로운 방안을 모색하는 매우 뜻깊고 발전적인 장이 될 것으로 기대합니다. 앞으로도 우리 대학과 한국 및 유럽의 연구소, 관련 기관 등의 전문가들이 함께 협력하여 인류의 소중한 문화유산을 보존하는 데 지속적으로 힘써 주실 것을 당부드립니다. 마지막으로 오늘 이 자리를 마련하기 위하여 애써 주신 관계자 여러분의 노부에 감사드리며 오늘의 국제 심포지움이 성공적으로 개최되기를 기대하겠습니다. 감사합니다.
Thank you for uh, the speech from um, Korean colleagues. And so um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Ms. Sonia Giovinazzi, a senior neo research with the strong skills on technologies for monitoring and for the diagnosis damage on critical infrastructure and cultural heritage preservation and restoration area. And so I give the floor to Sonia to start and uh, chair the first station of the event. Yes, good morning, Director Giorgio Gradito, uh, Graditi. Sorry, I think there is also Del Medico, which is representing Dr. Del Medico, the uh, Italian embassy in Korea, that would like to give uh, the greetings from the embassy. Thank you very much, Dr. Del Medico. There is a problem with the mic, I think, the microphone. Dr. Nicola, the medical, can you try again? We couldn't hear you. Thank you. But uh, his microphone doesn't work. Uh, we, we can uh, start the, the session on ICT technology for monitoring and for diagnosis damage. And after, we can uh, try to connect again Dr. the medical for uh, for his speech. Uh, I absolutely agree on that. Uh, yes, so let's uh, let's start the technical session. Uh, they are all welcome uh, to the scientific session of this symposium. And we are really honored to have here uh, excellent speakers uh, from uh, uh, universities and research institutions from both uh, Korea and Europe, as well as from international organization. And uh, as uh, uh, Director Graditi, uh, Introduce me, I'm Sonia Giovinazzi, I'm a, um, a research and project manager in Enea, and I'm very glad to co-chair this session together with uh, Dr. sang from A3, that I hope is here. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I am sang principal researcher in A3. I am the project leader for the project JRDCH, funded by NST, that is supporting the organization of this symposium. Session one aims to provide an overview on ICT technologies for monitoring and diagnosing and damage. Session two focuses on frameworks and best practices towards cultural heritage preservation in order to identify possible further areas where useful ICT technologies can be developed. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's introduce our first uh, speaker, and then uh, we will try again to get uh, uh, the greetings from uh, uh, Dr. Del Medico. Um, before starting, uh, I will just uh, two remarks: uh, one for the speakers, uh, please uh, keep uh, strictly the fifteen minutes time allocated. I will need to stop you if time run out unfortunately, and uh, to the kind and uh, attendees of uh, this symposium, I would like to invite you to type your questions in the chat box. Uh, so the speaker will try to answer to your question in real time. 
uh, or uh, even in the future. I hope uh, this will remain as a discussion forum and also as a place where we can uh, connect and uh, keep in contact each other. So please join me welcoming our first speaker, Professor Mario Tena from Foundation Santa Maria La Real in Spain, where he is coordinator of the Heritage Conservation Research and Development Areas. As such, uh, Professor Tena, uh, Tena manages uh, different European research projects uh, and the number of intervention on on cultural heritage, uh, targeting their better conservation, valorization, management, and use. So Professor Tena will present about uh, monitoring heritage system as a risk control solution for cultural assets in Spain. Professor Tena, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to hear uh, your excellent lecture. Thank you. Hello all. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for your presentation. Uh, as you have told, uh, as you have said, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, monitoring heritage system as a risk control solution for cultural assets in Spain. Um, first of all, I have to present our our foundation because it is important to understand to better understand uh, the project. This is the the village of Aguilar de Campo in the north of Spain in Palencia, and that monastery that you can see in the image is our main office. And this is, this is important because this is the same monastery 40 years ago and uh, the monastery nowadays. This process that we have experienced by ourselves uh, gives us the opportunity to learn a lot about, about the restoration and the importance of the preventive conservation. That is why we have put a lot of effort uh, to develop different projects and initiatives uh, related with preventive conservation. One of them was monitoring heritage system. This is a developed to apply a layer of technology to heritage in order to get more information and new information about this building. The main characteristic of this system is uh, the installation through the building of different sensors, devices, uh, in order to control different parameters from the, from the buildings, uh, such as CO2, temperature, the weather, mm, fire, structural conditions, energy consumption, luminosity, and so on. We have developed, we have controlled these parameters in order to apply to different areas of the management, such as preventive conservation, security, energy efficiency, use management, and so on. Again, the, the main performance of the system, or the main idea of the, of the system is to install these nodes and devices and sensors through the building to control these parameters that I have, present, I have told to you. And the, the devices collect this information and send it to the platform through the cloud, where we have implemented different algorithms to process this data and to transform this data into knowledge. We have a spare team of architects, engineers that have put all of their knowledge in these algorithms. With this, with this knowledge, sorry, we can send to our customers different alarms, we can create different reports, and we can present this information through different interfaces, through mobile or through remote interfaces. One of our main development is the, or, or our main uh, achievements is the, the, the visualization that we have created to present uh, this information to our customers, because we have learned it's, it is so important to make the information understandable, understandable for them. The first, in, in the first visualization that we have created is a geographical information system where we have put, we, we have, uh, located all the buildings that we have uh, we are controlling right now and we have created a set of indicators in order to um, to give uh, to our customers the opportunity to to see in what condition their building are of course if they want to consult some data they have the, the, the opportunity to create some different charts to compare different sources of data from different parameters of devices of the on the building and our, 
one of our main developments is the visualization that we have created in this is an example of one of them where we can put uh, the main points and the main devices of on each building uh, to present the most relevant information for our, uh, to our customers in each point we have uh, we can select the most important parameters uh, in order to to present the last results or, or the last data that we have collected and also the evolution during last days these are customized presentations for each building because heritage is not uh, like an industrial building on or normal building heritage has its own personality and we have to create um, customized visualizations for for them as you can see on the right of this image uh, we so also the general condition or, or we have created a general condition uh, of each building according to the results that we have uh, collected during the monitorization if we apply this solution uh, to a city we have created this, a smart heritage city where we can put the information from di different buildings in this case this is an image from the um, from the village of avila Another important option is the possibility to create uh, automatic reports, uh, also customized for, for its building, where we can put the last results, also the evolution, and we can uh, show our customers different comparisons with the last years um, related with energy consumption or use management or preventive conservation. Once we know the, the, the performance of the system, uh, we want to share with you uh, uh, one, one of its application. In this case, structural risk control. We identify three phases to, uh, related with a structural risk control. Phase one, control prior to intervention. Phase two, control during an intervention. And phase three, control after an intervention. We have, we have applied and uh, we have installed in different, um, in many different buildings to control parameters related with these structural conditions and we want to share with you three examples of this of this application the first one is a little hermitage in villanueva de la torre where we apply uh, applied a uh, phase one and phase three in this case we have a tower we have with with a big crack with a big vertical crack and nobody knows if this crack were growing or had to stop it. We proposed the installation of two physiometers of the monitoring heritage system to control if this movement uh, were growing or not. Thanks to, this, um, to these devices, we can check that their movements uh, were growing and we propose and we achieve the, the, the possibility to make an intervention in this tower in order, in order to ensure its stability and to repair the crack. Once we finished this intervention, we modify the installation of the monitoring also to, to control if the intervention was succeed or not. Luckily, mm, this building continues in good condition nowadays and we could check what uh, the, the intervention was okay for the for this situation the second example is the chart of san martin in salamanca in this case this is a big chart chart with also big movements and big deformations and again nobody knows if these move, movements were growing or not to solve this situation we proposed again the installation of monitoring heritage system in this case based on different clean clinometers and and other devices with complementary information we had the possibility to cross this information to these different sources of information in order to get better understanding of the behavior of the building with this study with this research we could give some uh, recommendations to to the property in order to solution to, to solve the situation 
uh, again, we create a nice visualization to make easy the understanding of the situation to our property and, and to, to the property and to the to our customers. Uh, once we have understand it, understood the, the situation, we proposed a, again an, an intervention, and nowadays they are working on that on that point. The last example uh, is San Isidro de Leon Chapel. This building, as you can see, has really really nice wall paintings and very important one wall paintings. And next to to this to this chapel, the property was going to carry out a demolition work, a really important demolition work to, to remodel a museum. Uh, but they, they were very worried, very worried uh, about the condition of this wall painting because it was a possibility to, to the vibration to reach these, these vaults and these wall paintings. To solve again the situation, we proposed the installation of different set of accelerometers in order to control the different ways and the different possibilities uh, of, uh, for the vibration to reach the wall paintings uh, through the floor, through the slabs, or through the bolts. Thanks to this installation, we could um, characterize the, the normal performance and the normal vibration that the building had. Once the work started, we could uh, fix a set of alarms to notify the, the staff of the work if the vibration were higher than usual or they could have uh, the, the, to give them the possibility to take into account the, the vibration in each moment on each moment. Uh, according to these notifications, they could modify and they modify, really modify the resources that they were using to, 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 make the, to do the work. It was a really complicated and really interesting uh, solution and application. This is an image of the notifications that the, we were sending to the staff in order to, to give them information about the different level of vibration and different alarms that they uh, were reciting. Uh, luckily, nowadays, this, wall, uh, th th this work uh, had finished and, we, uh, and the wall painting uh, is in perfect condition and we are really happy with that. <laughs> and the last part of the presentation is the MHS lab. This is a lab uh, of uh, a a fun the, the foundation lab. This is the place where where we have developed of of uh, all of our application of all of our solutions. Um, we make um, a lot of analysis before the installation in real in in, in other places in customer in customer buildings. Um, we have developed in in this place a, a lot of research, of course. We, we were really happy if any of you has an idea or has a research or a project uh, to, it, it could be interesting to apply in this, in this space. Uh, it, could be, it, it would be really nice for us to, to, to try to help you to, to, do, this, to do this work. Um, well, that's all by my side. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Professor Tena, for this very interesting uh, lecture. And I'm sure you will have a lot of people <laughs> interested to test uh, these devices and your research. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, let's uh, try now um, again the connection with Dr. Del Medico. We are very glad uh, to have uh, him uh, representing the Italian Embassy in Seoul. So please, Dr. Del Medico, the floor is yours. I think we still have technical issues, which is really a pity this morning. Everything was working fun wonderfully. <laughs> I don't know. No, we cannot hear at all, unfortunately. Can you hear us? So maybe if you can stay. 
Um, if you can stay even farther, maybe if you can type no. Uh, if you can stay a few minutes uh, farther, I give the floor to uh, second. Uh, actually, Dr. Sang Yong will give the floor to the second speaker. Thank you, Sonia. Mm. Let's welcome to the virtual stage the second speaker of the symposium, uh, Professor Yang Wen Zhou, KNU South Korea. We will present about damage diagnosis and restoration of cultural heritage based on digital technology. Professor Zhou has been an associate professor in the Department of Cultural Heritage Conservation Sciences, Gongju National University. He is an expert member of ECOMOS, ISCS, and was selected as a digital heritage expert by Korea Employment Information Services in 2020. Professor Zhou, it's a good place to start your excellent lecture. Yes, uh, thank you for introduce, introducing me. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yang Hun Zhou of Gongju National University, South Korea. Uh, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my study. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, damage diagnosis and restoration of cultural heritage uh, based on digital technology. I'll begin by summarizing uh, the contents of my presentation. Uh, firstly, I'll give you background and aims of this study in introduction. Then I'm going to go over three case studies such as uh, uh, damage diagnosis, uh, displacement analysis, restoration of damage heritage. Lastly, uh, I'd like to give you discussion and conclusion of this study. Our first chapter is the uh, introduction. As you know, a stone heritage occurs change of original form uh, by uh, natural, uh, natural and intentional deterioration, uh, structural deformation, uh, dismantling and assembling, and uh, conservation treatment. Accordingly, uh, various non-destructive testing methods, uh, such as uh, a damage map, uh, portable microscope, uh, water absorption, uh, XRF uh, analysis, uh, ultrasonic measurement, uh, infrared thermography, uh, rebound hardness, uh, total station surveying, and sensor measurement are used to diagnose of stone heritages. Uh, I've been uh, focusing on applying this MDT method uh, to stone heritages uh, between uh, 2006 to 2016. However, uh, with, the recent, uh, with the recent development of computer uh, image processing and digital device uh, like 3D scanning, uh, the digitalization of cultural heritage or urban digital heritage is gaining attention globally. Uh, from 2017 to the pre present, I'm also trying to study digital solution uh, for uh, preservation, conservation, and restoration of cultural heritages. As you know, uh, the acquisition of shape information based on numeric data is very important uh, for systematic uh, measurement. Uh, to respond to the deformation of stone heritages. The 3D scanning and uh, printing are representative digital technology uh, for recording and documenting the shape deformation and restoring original form. This study uh, developed and applied very digital solutions uh, such as uh, damage diagnosis, uh, displacement analysis, and restoration of damaged heritages. Uh, first, uh, uh, first uh, I'd like to introduce a case study uh, about the damage diagnosis. Uh, these dinosaur fossils in Gunsan have 14 trackways. Uh, as shown in the photogrammetry video, uh, you can see uh, 189 uh, footprints. Uh, 
Uh, in this study, a uh, handheld 3D scan was performed twice for footprint fossils uh, with severe exfoliation uh, and splintering. Uh, and damage diagnosis and short-term monitoring uh, were conducted using uh, digital elevation modeling and uh, uh, deviation analysis. These photos uh, show conservation condition of some footprint. Uh, 3D scan and deviation analysis were performed in five months intervals, uh, which included a winter season. Uh, from the analysis, uh, the conservation condition was largely classified into three groups of uh, fine, normal, and poor uh, based on tolerance range. Uh, overall track waste showed severe short-term damage uh, due to exfoliation and splintering of the sedimentary rock. Our next case study is uh, displacement analysis. Uh, the five-story stone pagoda in Gumgulsan Mountain uh, in a uh, representative cultural heritage uh, constructed in the uh, end of the 14th century. Uh, the, pagoda, uh, the stone pagoda has experienced uh, structural deformation and physical damages, uh, such as uh, crack, uh, scaling, uh, fragmentation, and gap. Uh, gaps between stone members. Uh, for this placement analysis of the stone pagoda, a uh, terrestrial radar scanning was applied. And through this, the effect of the dismantling and assembling uh, could be uh, quantitatively identified. Uh, from the analysis, the stone pagoda uh, before dismantling showed approximately uh, 31 to uh, 174 millimeter of displacement uh, in the each story of elevation and plane directions. Accordingly, uh, this stone pagoda was dismantled by a master expert. After assembling, uh, the structural deformation was largely improved in elevation and plane directions. Uh, as shown in the graph, a displacement of the stone pagoda after assembling were rapidly decreased compared to before dismantling. As such, the dismantling and assembling worked quite effectively in restoring the structural stability of the stone pagoda. It was concluded, uh, concluded uh, that monitoring would be required uh, for structural stability uh, through regular 3D scanning. Uh, from now on, uh, I'm going to explain about restoration of damaged heritage. Uh, the Stone Buddha statue in Chuncheon National Museum is composed of uh, a xeolithic tuff. Uh, and was discovered with five fragments. In particular, uh, cracks and missing parts were observed around the head. Uh, a non-contact restoration of the Stop Buddha statue was performed by converging various digital technologies, uh, 3D scanning, uh, uh, digital virtual restoration modeling, a design mock-up printing, assembly simulation, and uh, final 3D printing restoration. Uh, in part particular, a systematic uh, design mock-up and simulation were used to enhance the heuristic-based assembly of the uh, virtually restored model. The 3D scanning model uh, clearly revealed the uh, complete shape of the statue and the polygon mesh and RGB texture mapping models uh, showed uh, high reality effects. The virtual restoration of the missing part was performed, uh, performed using a hefting modeling system. 
Uh, for the virtual restoration modeling of the head, uh, first, a uh, leprous model was selected and its mirroring and Boolean modeling were performed. Furthermore, uh, estimation part modeling was achieved uh, through historical research. Then heuristic-based assembly was verified by design mock-up uh, printing and digital uh, analog simulation. In particular, to address assembly inter, uh, interference, uh, the interface surface was modified and reprocessed several times. Uh, photopolymerization 3D printing uh, was used for the actual restoration and the surface of the printed output was colored to prevent yellowing and joined to the missing part. The restoration pro uh, processes based on digital technologies have uh, uh, provided a new experience to museum visitors. In a similar way with the Stone Buddha statue, uh, digital virtual rest uh, restoration and 3D sand printing technology were used to improve the stability of the rampart wall, wall and its viewing environments. To achieve this goal, a virtual restoration of a weathered rampart stone was performed reflecting the surface texture and virtual metal support were installed uh, to examine the field of applicability. The virtually restored rampart stones were printed using the sand material. Uh, to apply the printed stones, uh, metal support were placed and the printed rampart stone were installed in the missing part. In discussion and conclusion, uh, let me now sum up. Uh, first, for damage diagnosis, di diagnosis of dinosaur trackways, uh, this study performed short-term monitoring of their conservation condition and uh, cla uh, classified into three condition groups uh, based on tolerance range. In addition, uh, for displacement analysis of the stone powder, uh, terrestrial laser scanning was uh, applied. And through this, uh, the effect of the dismantling and assembling uh, could be quantitatively identified. The 3D virtual restoration of the missing part was performed by the haptic voxel uh, modeling system. In particular, virtual restoration model was printed using various 3D printer for direct utilization in the restoration of stone heritages. In closing, uh, hardware, uh, hardware and software technologies are currently undergoing rapid development. The digital documentation and its uh, utilization are essential for diagnos diagnosis and restoration of stone heritages. In particular, the integration of 3D scanning and printing would provide the significant solution for non-contact restoration and digital replication. Today, uh, I have shown you of various various cases of damage diagnosis and restoration, uh, restoration uh, based on digital technology. Uh, I will keep trying uh, to develop and apply digital solutions for stable conservation of stone heritages. Okay, uh, that and uh, that ends my talk. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for your kind attention. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Young Kun, you, Joe, for your Joe. Sorry for um, this very interesting presentation and for keeping the time. Thank you. We try again uh, uh, to connect uh, Dr. Del Medico to bring uh, the greetings from the uh, embassy. 
Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. We made it. it <laughs> we is made in these it. Times that you realize how important is ICT in, uh, in all aspects of our life. So, thank you very much to the lecturers that have already delivered the very interesting presentations. Um, let me also um, bring the greetings on behalf of Ambassador Failla and the Office of the Scientific Attaché here at the Embassy of Italy in Seoul to President Gilberto Di Aluce, President Kim Jong Jun, President Kim Jong Mo, and to all the distinguished Korean and Italian lecturers, uh, scientists, and representatives uh, of universities and institutions. Um, today's meeting is a concrete demonstration that cooperation between Italy and Korea stretches across many sectors and we, that we both aim to deepen such cooperation. Our countries are leaders in innovation and high tech, as well as cultural champions that are committed to preserving and restoring our heritage. Exchanging best practices in the area of cultural heritage preservation and restoration through ICT is the four mutually beneficial. Dialogue and interaction in this area can also have positive spillovers in other sectors where we work together. The growing broadband and mobile connectivity, the access to online data, the use of remote sensing technologies and platforms, these trends determine also the future of cultural assets management. The accessibility of data on cultural heritage and the use of mobile applications for accessing cultural venues and archives also stimulate citizen exposure to culture and their involvement in the management of cultural assets. New tools for digitization and virtualization are used to protect cultural heritage and communicate its unique value. The investment into digitization of historical documents, cultural artifacts, collections and intangible assets tends into improved access, promotion and better management of the data. Online platforms have become the dominant environment for professionals and general audience and serve as attractive channels for promoting heritage of the regions. At the same time, it is a challenge to establish a common digital environment for sharing of community data and tools. For example, in Europe, almost 90% um, of cultural heritage has not yet, yet been digitized. There is therefore a persistent need for sharing and updating knowledge and for identifying common solutions. Recognizing the enabling role of the ICT in implementation of cultural heritage policies, Italy and Korea are aiming to promote the use of digital platforms and tools and share experiences in this area. Although I only arrived in Korea one year ago, I could already be impressed by the high level of commitment of universities, research institutes and government bodies in promoting and protecting culture through ICT. We can learn a lot from each other and hopefully very soon we will be able to interact in person. During the pandemic, we were able to appreciate even more the potential that ICT can have on our jobs and lives. It is thanks to ICT that we can participate in the second edition of this symposium. Such potential can be developed further and contribute to strengthen Italy's and Korea's role as global examples in innovation, as well as in cultural preservation and promotion. In this spirit, I thank all the participants and I wish you a fruitful seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Del Medico. We indeed appreciate uh, this greeting from the embassy and the great overview you gave on the fruitful collaboration between these two countries, uh, Italy and Korea. Thank you again. So we can come back to the technical sessions. Uh, I give the um, floor to Dr. Sanyun to introduce. Uh, oh, actually, uh, uh, it's me <laughs> introducing uh, the third speaker. Sorry, I'm a bit confused with this uh, this technical issue. Okay, so uh, let's now welcome to uh, our vi uh, virtual stage Professor Andrea Dallasta, uh, who is full professor of structural engineering at the Department of Architecture 
architecture and design of the University of Camerino in Italy, uh, where he also uh, is a member of the governing body of uh, the university. Uh, Professor Dallasta is technical director also of the Inter-University Consortium Fabri, who is working in Italy towards uh, the risk assessment and resilience announcement of uh, uh, infrastructure. So Professor Dallasta will present about the vulnerability model for the risk assessment of cultural heritage. And uh, Professor Dallasta, the floor is yours. So we are looking forward to hearing your uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, just a moment. Uh, well, can you see my screen? Uh, everything is working. Uh, It's okay. Oh, great. Uh, yes, you can. Okay, okay. Please go, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Sonia, for your kind uh, introduction and good morning uh, to, to everyone. Uh, my presentation concerns vulnerability models for risk assessment of uh, cultural heritage, and uh, it is a part of a more general concept of risk. Uh, the risk is a measure of a probability of suffering and adverse consequence over a time interval. And generally, uh, it is organized by separating the role of uh, external action, uh, described by hazard, and uh, uh, the vulnerability evaluation that evaluate the propension to suffer damage. And this is a general concept, but uh, for a numerical or evaluation of a vulnerability or better uh, the work that we call uh, vulnerability analysis we need uh, some consequence functions that give us some inform precise information relating the hazard measured in some way to the uh, consequence and also in this case we generally introduce some metrics to evaluate the consequences uh, I, the results I'm going to present uh, is part of an ARC project, that is an ARC uh, project uh, uh, supported and uh, funded by the European community. Well, the risk assessment as well as the vulnerability assessment can be uh, developed at different scale with different objectives. Uh, like an example, we are interested to evaluate this type of assessment uh, at district or regional level. Uh, in order to organize our planning and uh, use of our resource. But uh, other times we are more interested about uh, uh, assessment uh, evaluated or performed uh, a smaller level like buildings of material, because in this case we are more interested uh, about uh, action to preserve our uh, cultural asset or upgrade our, our asset. So, uh, different vulnerability analysis must be carried out uh, and uh, they uh, require different uh, different consequence function. Uh, we try an overview by starting from the architectural heritage in Italy. The Italian architectural heritage is constituted by a large number of historical mass reconstruction like churches, towers, palaces and so on. But in particular, churches have a special role because they are widespread uh, over all the territory. And also, generally, we, they have a significant importance for local communities. And furthermore, uh, they generally have a very high artistic value. Uh, some numbers, the total number of uh, architectural cultural assets in Italy is around uh, 65,000 and the churches uh, are around uh, 40,000. Well, uh, each church is different from another, but generally they show a similar seismic response. So uh, it is possible to analyze this problem in a unitary way, in a unitary manner. And uh, uh, also because churches uh, consist of uh, uh, some recurrent uh, component like a facade, a side walls, transept, and so on. So it is possible uh, to, to provide or to elaborate some vulnerability models that are uh, common for all the historical churches. 
And uh, the, the best way to define an histo a, a vulnerability model uh, consists in starting from the damage observed after an earthquake. So in this work, uh, uh, a model has been uh, uh, deduced from uh, uh, damage survey occurred uh, after the last earthquake in the district of Camerino, the last earthquake uh, occurred in, in 2016. And uh, in this district, uh, 521 churches are present and uh, 354 uh, were damaged uh, after the earthquake. Well, uh, so from, uh, from data, uh, some vulnerability models can be deduced, in particular two types of models uh, have been uh, obtained. The first one uh, concerns the physical damage of these churches, uh, so the direct consequences, and another model uh, is oriented to uh, evaluate the the economic uh, loss, the repairing cost involved by, by damage. And this permit to elaborate uh, some uh, scenarios, some uh, map of expected damage and expected uh, economic uh, loss after an earthquake, like in the uh, two figures in, in the bottom. On the left, we have the expected distribution of the damage level on these churches, La, uh, while in uh, the right we have a map of expected uh, economic loss in these, in these churches. Well, uh, a second level is the town level. In this case, uh, we have a lot of construction that are, are different. They are not all church, they are residential building and similar. And so, uh, in order to evaluate the vulnerability, we have to uh, analyze a, a, a more large set, a, a larger set of, uh, of properties involving the morphological properties of the construction, as well as the construction ages, construction technique, and also modification over time. Like an example, this is a, a, an analysis concerning the properties of uh, masonry that may have a different typology, different level of conservation and different strength property, and they can be classified uh, in uh, some way by uh, a, a direct survey and uh, a theoretical analysis. So at the end, we are able to arrive to a map of the overall vulnerability of construction in the historic center by combining material properties, construction properties, and so on, and using some theoretical model that uh, account for all of these uh, aspects of the problem. And uh, in the bottom and on the left, there is a picture of a final uh, vulnerability index of this type of construction on the city. And uh, it is evident that some construction are more uh, vulnerable and while others are less vulnerable. Finally, the more refined uh, level of analysis concern uh, the material. Material, uh, any particular material of the surface of the construction, material of the facades and the decoration. In this case, the degradation is a, a slow phenomena and a slow and progressive phenomena. And uh, it is mainly related to the environmental condition. So it is a, a different problem with respect to a previous one related to, uh, related to uh, disastrous event. Hazard in this case uh, are due from uh, the climate condition uh, and can be triggered by rainfall, temperature, freezing, thaw cycles or also uh, it may have uh, an anthropic nature because it, uh, it is due to pollutant concentration and similar. And the type of consequence are generally uh, two type of consequences. One related to the chemical action on the materials providing degradation and the other related to a physical degradation related to erosion or wetting and similar. Well, also in this case, it is possible to obtain some uh, more or less precise relationship relating uh, 
environment condition measured by a set of metrics, including uh, uh, pollutant as well as uh, humidity, temperature, and so on, to uh, the consequence uh, uh, that is generally, uh, <coughs> it generally consists or can be measured by the expected surface recession per unit time generally uh, per year. And also in this case, it is possible to elaborate this, this information uh, on a map, as in this case, where it is possible to evaluate the potential vulnerability of this construction or better, the facade and uh, decoration of this construction based on materials that compone uh, this, uh, this surface. Well, finally, I, I, I want to, to conclude my presentation uh, with some uh, reasoning about uh, the role of the monitoring uh, on the vulnerability assessment and consequently uh, on the planning of uh, mitigation actions. Monitoring uh, mm, permits uh, some, some activity and uh, it can be uh, organized in order to improve mechanical knowledge and vulnerability models. And obviously, if it is useful for the risk assessment and uh, to define, to decide about coping action. But also, it is important to collect information during extreme events, this to make emergency action more efficient. And also, it makes it possible to check response to continuous stresses and degradation process, because uh, this makes it possible uh, to adopt uh, tempestive intervention and improve the preservation of the asset. Monitoring obviously consists of a set of sensors uh, that uh, uh, provide data that are collected uh, and uh, uh, post-processed in order to, to evaluate the evolution or uh, variation in the response of the construction. Uh, currently, two, two important buildings in the city of Camerino are under investigation. The first one is the Palazzo Ducale, that is a Renaissance monument of Camerino. And in this case, monitoring aims to uh, obtain some specific objectives uh, related to uh, uh, improve the knowledge in order to uh, make more efficient the retrofitting action, to check the structural degradation, and also to collect information during the earthquake when earthquake uh, will uh, arrive. The second construction uh, uh, is a different construction with a different problem. The building is, the, is a church, is the Santa Maria in Via Church, that is a church uh, essentially built in the 17th century. Uh, in this case, the problem is different because the church was strongly damaged uh, after the, uh, the last earthquake. So a set of provisional uh, structure, provisional intervention has been erected uh, to preserve the, the building and the monitoring uh, want to check the efficiency of this provisional structure, but also a secondary objective consists in the uh, check of environmental condition in this temporary phase. Uh, in order to check the preservation of uh, the contents like frescoes and uh, decoration that cannot be moved uh, from, the, from the church. Uh, the strategy of monitoring of this building starts from uh, a, an improvement of the knowledge of the buildings by using three-dimensional survey and the relevant geometrical model, non-destructive test to, to know the characteristic uh, or properties of a mechanical of a material and also dynamic test to uh, obtain information about the overall behavior of the structure. But the, a lot of problem may uh, be of interest for this type of construction. So uh, this required a, a wide set of sensors with different uh, objects, objectives. Uh, there are some uh, accelerometer with high sensitivity that is of interest, like an example, to identify dynamic properties uh, uh, under ambient vibration. 
but also it is necessary to uh, to place the different type of accelerometer with a low sensitivity to analyze the response uh, to earthquake when an earthquake uh, occur. Uh, we also need to uh, to obtain information about at local level about uh, specific local damage like crackings, and in this case we have uh, to. Uh, use displacement transducer or also inclinometers to uh, give evidence to uh, rigid motion of some components and also uh, temperature sensor and environmental sensor that provide us information about temperature relative humidity and wind speed uh, Obviously, uh, this type of information permit uh, make it possible to uh, improve uh, our theoretical model, our predictive model, but uh, also some problems uh, are open at this stage of research regarding the interpretation of data. In particular, uh, a problem arises in uh, evaluate the variation in the response because this variation may be due to environmental uh, condition variation like temperature and uh, or up, or they, they may be due to uh, variation in uh, in the response of a structure due to a degradation or some damage in some parts and uh, it is not so simple to separate variation due to the first cause the environmental condition from the variation due to the second cause uh, the uh, the damage of a, of a structure. Well, uh, I finished my presentation of uh, an overview of problem of problems related to the vulnerability models, and thank you for your attention. Presentation. Uh, and yes, and this is part of also, if I can say, of the ARC project uh, that where uh, both Etri and I am from offer and uh, University of Camerino are engaged. So I'll pass uh, to uh, Dr. Sanyung for presenting the next speaker. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, please join me welcoming our first speaker, Professor Jungmin Niu, Nuj South Korea will present about automatic damage diagnosis for cultural heritage based on intelligent image analysis. Professor Yu is an assistant professor in the Department of Cultural Heritage Industry, Korea National University of Cultural Heritage. He has been involved in digital heritage at various academic societies and published the papers and have been actively involved in the community. His research interests are artificial intelligence for management of cultural heritage, augmented and virtual reality, and human computer interaction for cultural heritage applications. Professor Yu, everyone is waiting for your excellent lecture. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, the wonderful introductions of me. And it is very honorable to uh, present her in this uh, international symposium. Uh, I will, uh, let me start my uh, presentation. Uh, today's topic is automatic damage diagnosis for cultural heritage based on the intelligence image analysis. This is our uh, introduction. Our stone, uh, outdoor stone heritage uh, frequently lose their original appearance due to physical and chemical and biological weathering. Uh, the, the damage, this damage is caused by these factors not only threaten structural uh, stability, uh, but also damaging the prototype of the aesthetic value of the cultural property. This is very important to effectively detect damage uh, through the uh, continuous monitoring, analyzing the cause, and enable appropriate conservation treatment. This is uh, uh, the uh, existing um, uh, detection methods of our parties. First one is the visual uh, inspections by uh, manpower. The second, second one is uh, electronic device such as uh, photogrammetry, 
or laser scanning or infrared thermal and so on. However, these, these methods are so uh, time consuming and uh, costly. And so there is some uh, limitations. They should be carried out by experts in the field. And, or, and also these methods are uh, manually inspected by human. Uh, to overcome these uh, problems, uh, we present a damage detection uh, method using uh, artificial intelligence algorithm that is uh, automatically detects and classified the types of damage uh, occurring in the uh, heritage. Our systems uh, can, our damage warning system can support uh, initial response by automatically detecting and analysis uh, various type of uh, damage and display uh, uh, problem uh, occurring in wooden or stone heritage via uh, AI image analysis technology. Th these are our target types of uh, damage and displacement uh, problem, such as a crack, uh, scaling and spoiling, and loss and wooden spray, and plant, and so on. So uh, we present uh, some AI-based uh, diagnosis system. This is our overall the workflow. First, we uh, detect. Uh, capture the image through the uh, CCTV or digital or camera. And then we conduct some uh, image processing. And then we uh, train the AI model by the transfer learning or inception structure. And lastly, we test and evaluate for uh, uh, obtain the qualitative analysis. Especially, we use uh, the fast RCNN. It is a uh, reason based detection method. And that is a somewhat uh, slower uh, the algorithm, but there is a, has a good uh, high uh, accuracy. Uh, before we run this uh, uh, AI uh, based diagnosis systems, we first build the uh, data set such as collect and loss and detachments and bio uh, colonization. So uh, for the test, we select some uh, smaller uh, classes, uh, but uh, there is uh, also, we need some uh, uh, plants of uh, uh, training uh, data set for running the AI-based model. So we conduct uh, uh, data uh, image augmentation. This is very important to factors that can improve the performance of this model. It is uh, amounts of a training image data set. Uh, for this, we used uh, six methods, such as uh, 90 degree rotation, and left right reversal, and also we use, we adapt the brightness 50% and darkness 50%, and sharpening effects of the uh, for the uh, data augmentation. Yeah, this is our overall uh, AI based diagnosis system. First, we used uh, some input. We get uh, some uh, some input image, and also we used a uh, faster RCNN that consists of three motor. First one is convolution neural net. Second one is a region uh, proposal neural lag. And uh, lastly, is, is a faster RCNN. So uh, let me explain more detail. And the first model is the faster RCNN is for CNN. This is uh, for calculating the feature map. This is a compass the important information of the image. And then we perform the second module it's called is RPM. This is a server network, uh, which is just a region where object is possible. It is called a candidate region. Finally, uh, we perform the first RCNN. 
And this is for a determined what objects are for each zone. Yeah, this is our experimental uh, setting. And for the this uh, experiments, we conduct uh, 10 training units data set. It is very small for uh, because uh, we have a small uh, classified uh, some uh, uh, four classes. So we uh, collect some small uh, data set. Uh, to improve this performance of the uh, deep learning model, the uh, comparative uh, studies will be uh, conducted by augmenting the correct training data set. This is our uh, performance measures. We used uh, inter intersections of the union uh, measure. And this is our equ equation. This is our uh, experimental results. This is for the results, detection results of a crack. As you can see the, these figures, we can uh, check the feasibility of our deep learning model. Uh, we conduct, uh, conducted the experiments to detect four types of image and to perform image augmentation of clay and image type and compare the lizards before and after image processing. From the uh, experiments, we uh, observed that the image augmentation improved the score by the average of 70.5% when the amount of training tested was increased by seven times. This is our another uh, experimental lizards. The first one is detection lizards of a lost part. As you, you can see that the figures, we can, you also check the, the, uh, the feasibility of this deep learning model. The second one is uh, detachment. Last, uh, last one is detect, uh, detection lasers of a biological colonization. The loss uh, damage part is noticeable in the image. Uh, the score is detected up to 99%. However, uh, the edge of the loss part and other foreign matters are mixed. Uh, the score is detected as a 50% and the damage is not detected relative to small area area. Detachments and biological colonizations was detected with average of 98.67% accuracy when surrounding area and the damaged area are well uh, clearly distinguished well when uh, the damaged areas are, was large. This is our conclusion and, and uh, future works, uh, we present an automatic detection method using a deep learning algorithm uh, from the uh, premature uh, experimental lasers. We confirm that we also check the feasibility of the efficiency of this method. As a future work, we will try to uh, continuously uh, improve the performance of the detection system under different kinds of uh, damage or wooden or uh, stone heritage. This is our uh, progress uh, work. We develop, continuously develop the, the damage detection algorithm uh, for, uh, we can detect uh, some uh, crack or black, black case and break away and print uh, the parts. And also we can detect the displacement, the detection algorithm for uh, th three classes is tilt, defection, and separation using this uh, deep learning uh, algorithm. Uh, our uh, deep learning algorithm is for helping some people on expert, it's not just a uh, substitute this uh, human being. Just we want to helping for uh, making a decision. This is our. Uh, this is my uh, end of presentation.
Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to introduce this uh, speaker, um, Dr. Daniel. Um, are you ready? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Daniel uh, Lucas Russ from uh, Germany, the first speaker of session two, who will present about the ARC project. Uh, bringing together frameworks, tools, and strategies for protecting history, historic areas uh, from the impacts of uh, climate change and natural hazards. Daniel is a senior researcher at Fraunhofer Institute for Intelligent Analysis and Information Systems, IAIS. At Fraunhofer, uh, he is currently coordinating the EU Horizon 2020 projects, ARC and Original investigating resilience assessment methods for historic areas and developing a research roadmap for artificial intelligence in support of law enforcement agencies, respectively. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sangyu, uh, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will talk about the ARC project, give you a brief introduction about the project and what we are doing. This will happen in four parts. Uh, I will give you some rough numbers about the project. I will talk about roughly what we do. Uh, I will then talk about how we all of what we do, we bring this together in a consistent framework. And at the end, I will talk a bit of how you can get involved into the project. So some numbers. Uh, ARC is a research and innovation action uh, from Horizon Europe that started in June 2019 and will run until August 2022. It has a budget roughly over 6 million euros and a cumulative person power of 746 person months and involves partners from 16 uh, countries, or from 16 partners from Germany, Italy, Spain, Slovakia, Ireland and South Korea, which you can see uh, at the bottom of the slide. Now, what do we do in the project? Our overarching goal in the project is to support the improvement of resilience of historic areas by providing better knowledge. And historic areas in this case means cultural landscapes, uh, historic urban districts, um, and everything in this uh, sense. And we want to provide better knowledge first um, by providing new or better data on hazards and area condition, which means in this case, for example, that we have an information system that gathers several different data sets here, for example, on uh, urban land use, or we combine this with environmental data, so um, urban greening and stuff like that. Then we, in this platform, also have 3D models of cities, but also detailed 3D models of specific heritage sites so that you can combine all this data in one single platform and access is there. This platform also includes information on hazards, for example, the microzonation in Camerino, or um, climate extreme indices, for example, from weather stations in Valencia, where we look at maximum consecutive dry days or the daily maximum temperature. And as a last thing for the hazard part, we also include information on air pollution uh, in this uh, platform that can be accessed uh, in real time. And this data we then use to provide methods for risk and resilience assessment. And this then is usually done by first producing cause effect models in workshops, which you can see on the right, once in, when we still could meet in person. Nowadays, it looks more like in the bottom right, uh, we make that online. So how do, does a hazard affect a specific um, exposed element? What are the potential consequences in terms of physical, societal, uh, economic, intangible and functional impacts? And what are the factors that basically strengthen or weaken those effects? And these models are then used for risk analysis, um, which is done by Enea uh, on a territorial scale, but also uh, on a building level. And this is, uh, of course, also supported by the colleagues from Mika Marina. Based on this risk, assessment, we try to identify measures and strategies that help to increase the resilience. And this means that we have developed a database 
that we can filter for several different um, basic information, specific information search measures that provide very detailed information about very specific um, resilience measures, for example, adaptive reuse of building, uh, air conditioning, or st uh, something like that, and whether or not uh, which hazard type is affected by that, which uh, disaster risk management phase is that, uh, which uh, scale of implementation. And you can also compare measures in order to build a potential portfolio of suitable measures to address the risk you identified previously. All of this we are doing in a more holistic way. So we are not just looking at buildings, but we're looking at the historic area as a social ecological system, which means we're looking at the natural landscape or the natural environment, the built environment, the culture, the policies, the society, and also the economy in this area. And we look at this under different climate scenarios, but also under different hazard scenarios. And um, for the measures to be implemented, we also look at different financing uh, solutions, which is done by Sogesca. So for each measure, we identify how do I best finance this in my city or in my area. And all of this we are doing while making sure that the results are local, particularly applicable and transferable. And that uh, is done by involving four cities in our project, which are Bratislava in Slovakia, Camarino in Italy, Hamburg in Germany, and Valencia in Spain. They are all looking at different hazards. For example, Bratislava is looking at extreme precipitation, Camerino, of course, at earthquakes, Hamburg is looking at subsidence, and Valencia at extreme temperatures and extreme precipitation. And all of these different uh, cities also have different pilot sites. So in Ham Bratislava, we're looking at the old town center and the Devon Castle ruin. In Camerino, like we heard, we look at the old town center and the Santa Maria and Via Church at the Ducal Palace. And in Hamburg, at the World Heritage Site, Schweiderstadt and Kontorhaus Viertel. And Valencia, um, we, there we are looking at the Huerta de Valencia and Albufera de Valencia. And all of these, of course, are different heritage types. So all of our solutions should work across different heritage types at different scales and different uh, areas. Now, uh, how do we bring all of this together? Because there's a lot of tools, a lot of results, a lot of methods. And here the question for us was, well, we look at two different things, climate change adaptation and disaster risk management. And those two planning processes are not often addressed together. And this is due to, well, disastrous management often having a more short-term time frame, while climate change adaptation has a more long-term uh, time frame. And climate change adaptation looks more on the slow onset future risk, while disastrous management often looks at existing or at more sudden risks. Um, but both planning processes have common goals and employ several uh, similar measures and have a compatible underlying philosophy. So they both aim to reduce vulnerability and support sustainable development. Both use, for example, ecosystem-based solutions, engineered solutions, social solutions, and institutional measures. And both have cyclical planning cycles. So what we did in the process is we asked the question, why is there no combined planning cycle for climate change adaptation and disaster risk management? And well, we tried to answer this question by providing a new cyclical process. It has 10 steps that combines climate change adaptation, which would be the blue um, part of the planning process, and disaster risk management, uh, which is the red and yellow uh, part of the process. This is organized in two operating phases. In the pre-disaster phase, the disaster risk management process was extended with the adaptation planning steps. Um, so preparing the ground, uh, not just identifying prevention and mitigation measures, but also climate change adaptation and emergency response measures. Uh, then assessing and selecting those measures, implementing selected options, and then also establishing a monitoring and evaluation framework. And all of these steps uh, within the uh, framework cover climate change adaptation, disaster management together, but also heritage management and also address uh, issues of social justice. So do I uh, evolve um, vulnerable population groups, disproportionately affected populations and all of this? Uh, you can find more information on this in our deliverable D7.3 and we also have a forthcoming SEN workshop agreement where we try to standardize this process and give more guidance uh, on what to do in which step, which requirements you have, which recommendations we have. Now, bringing this all together with the tools and methods we developed, what you can see here is across the blue normal operating phase, we can identify all the different tools we develop in the pro uh, project. So we have a resilience assessment dashboard that is uh, suitable for 
the preparing the grounds and giving a, getting a baseline resilience assessment also monitoring we have uh, the information system i showed you that helps to identify information and support the risk and vulnerability assessment we have the uh, arcgss where we can actually do scenario analysis we have a database where you can identify uh, prevention measures adaptation measures and so on and we have what we call an arc hub which is a collaborative space to actually do the resilience assessment and access all of those tools and to assess whether or not you actually have implemented this process in a suitable way or how, how far along in implementing this cyclical process you are, we uh, developed the ARC Resilience Assessment Dashboard, uh, in short RAD, which helps you in different topics to assess how resilient you are. This is based on the UNDRR Disaster Resilience Scorecard for Cities. And basically, um, for each of those different ten topics, you answer questions. You basically gather your local stakeholders around and then answer questions like, do you already have a, ris a risk assessment? Did you conduct one? Is, is it regularly updated? Uh, is it also value validated by an external partner, for example? And doing this for all the different topics then allows you to identify steps in the process where you have weak spots and how to address those weak spots in the future and who should address this and how to address this. Yeah, that is a very, very brief overview of the project. And if you want to get involved, we have two different ways on doing that. Um, a few months ago, we kickstarted a, a European Research and Innovation Task Force together with our sister project, Shelter and Hyperion, which is, aims at coordinating efforts on climate neutral and resilient urban districts and looks at three different thematic areas. So we want to develop resilience strategies, we want to um, bring together information on assessing and monitor risk and resilience, and we want to see how we can de design equitable solutions for and with uh, communities. And the other part to get involved would be the standardization. As I said, we already started with the standardization process, and here we want to transfer project results into national and international standards. We have started the same workshop agreement on the ArcDRM framework, but we are investigating the development of further uh, SEND workshop agreements. And we hope that the ARC standard will be adopted on national and international level. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please just drop me an email. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this great overview on the ARC project uh, that I would like to say you are managing in a wonderful, excellent way. So thank, thank you. you. Again, you might have realized that uh, we changed a bit uh, the agenda. Uh, this was due to a technical uh, problem. So we had Daniel that uh, was the first speaker or the second session. Uh, but uh, now we solved all. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce to this uh, virtual stage, Dr. Roberta Fantoni, that uh, is uh, the head of an AI division, technology application for security and health, where the bulk of uh, research uh, on uh, cultural heritage uh, conservation and preservation is uh, held in Enea. As such, as she is a DNA representative of the Italian node of the Joint Research Unit of the European Distributed Research Infrastructure on Heritage Science, and she is also a DNA person for the Techni Technology Cultural District Center of Excellence of Lazio region. Both these initiatives have been mentioned this morning by our Enea president. So, uh, Roberta Fantoni will present about diagnostic technologies for cultural heritage developed uh, with the support of an ICT platform and further ex uh, expertise gained in the framework of the Technological Cultural District initi Initiative of Lazio, Lazio region in Italy. So, Roberta Fantoni, the floor is yours and we are looking forward to hear your interesting overview. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, I hope you can hear me very well. Um, I want to stress uh, how it is important to have a suitable ICT platform for digital data processing uh, where uh, when we are dealing with a matter uh, of cultural heritage uh, preservation and uh, fruition. Uh, so what is the problem, the needs? Let's start from the needs. Cultural heritage has a very, very delicate surfaces uh, that need uh, diagnostics. Uh, uh, diagnostics should be very often remote because are large surfaces, especially painted surfaces, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, stratification due to the centuries and to the technique of realization. 
they are uh, undergoing uh, um, effect of the environment, damages, erosion, and also they have an, are undergoing a noxious effect for, for instance, earthquakes, for instance, uh, floods, fires. And so they, uh, the situation is very complex. Structural monitoring uh, usually has to accompany diagnostics in order to be sure that uh, preserving a surface uh, uh, will not be a waste of time if the entire building is getting ruined. And uh, um, monitoring is uh, one of the best tools to do this. So I will show you a few examples of what we are doing and how the platform, the ICT platform, adapted to the data that we are providing. Uh, one of the excellence that uh, we have developed uh, in Enea is the technology of remote laser scanners from our former leader experience. We have laser scanners at very high resolution amplitude modulated laser scanners uh, that work with different wavelength, 3D, three wavelength in the visible. So they uh, give back um, very high resolution images, uh, uh, sub-millimeter resolution at uh, a distance typically up to 30 to 50 meter. And uh, they can uh, be merged with images collected with other scanners that um, uh, collect the spectra. So for each point, uh, we, uh, there is also a spectrograph that uh, detect uh, the spectrum that can be fluorescence, that can be Raman at the nearest distance, that can be a point spectrum of atomic emission. So we can collect a lot of data in situ and at different remote distance. Then we have to do something with this data. Another NIA excellence that has been mentioned by our presidents this morning is the vibrating uh, tables uh, at NIA Casaccia. There uh, it is possible to simulate earthquakes and uh, the simulation is usually done on models on models in scale of structural critical elements. In order to uh, uh, have a better possibility to uh, use this data, the ICT division, since the beginning, developed a system that is called DISCO, that is a virtual laboratory where the user who supply the model or the problem relevant to that model can follow the simulation of the vibration and uh, in real time. And they can see the effect and possibly suggest other modes of checking. And this is uh, possible uh, because the connection is run by our uh, parallel computer, Cresco. Here you see an example of the oldest of a church in Istanbul, uh, and the critical element is made by breathing. So, um, uh, with the regional phones uh, in uh, 2015, uh, the, the platform, uh, the ICT platform was uh, improved to uh, collect data from any sensor that can broadcast data to them. So, it became an active platform where the uh, scientists can also control the, the data acquisition from remote. And this is called the E3Es platform, and you can see here a picture of all the uh, all almost all most of the in uh, implementation that we did in this regional project, uh, from the vibrating table that was already available to thermography to laser scanner to XRF. Uh, to um, irradiation for sterilization of uh, samples and so on. And the, 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 it was possible the remote control of the experiment and, of course, the repository of the, of the data. Uh, this is another example. We scanned uh, in that project a thumb, uh, the Etruscan thumb, and we got a 3D model. Then, with the support of the GAR consortium that ran the network uh, in Italy, uh, we um, uh, put the model uh, in internet, and in the model, 
the data can be found. So um, uh, clicking at certain point, you get the fluorescence image that say where paraloid has been used to restore the, 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 the thumb or that says uh, which pigment were used because you get the, spect the Raman spectrum of the ochre or you get the XRF of uh, blue, uh, Egyptian blue and so on. I don't show you the video because it takes some time and uh, you have to trust me from the example that you see here. Another example is the importance of monitoring system. You know Italy is a, a land of earthquake. Uh, we uh, put some fiber optic sensor, Bragg sensor, uh, of, uh, on the tower, on the bell tower of uh, Rieti Cathedral within this uh, regional project, project. The cathedral was chosen because it, the bell tower was almost destroyed in a former earthquake. And during our monitoring, there was the last earthquake in Amatrice, we hope the last, 2016. So you can see within the long-term vibration um, recorded every day, the small uh, shots of the uh, earthquake itself that corresponded to elastic vibration. That was very useful and it was important because it was recorded and broadcast to ENEA and stored immediately. So it could be seen by uh, the um, people of the administration that wanted to know if the tower was damaged by the event, which was not the case. This is a very uh, simple example, but it is important if we had not stored the data, they were still at the bell tower, not sent by broadcast and to the net, it would have taken some days to get the answer. Uh, then a few uh, notes about the last uh, three regional projects where Enea participated with a significant effort for diagnostics, for seismic, and for the digital platform, starting from the digital platform for cultural heritage of the region, which is important uh, to go a step further in, in the data fusion. So um, here you have an example uh, of what Enea did for this uh, digitalization. Um, there was uh, the, the need to, the task to uh, realize a middleware component where data and uh, metadata were integrated and uh, they were completed with their uh, georeferenciation and with all the knowledge coming also from human science in a way that we can have a very good archive and scientific data collected by the scanner in this case uh, was the reconstruction of the 3D model that could be seen in the archive. Uh, the, uh, the philosophy in this platform was to uh, use the data uh, according to the FAIR principle. They should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this is promoted by uh, 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 European uh, protocols. And the data are organized for semantic uh, searches. And you can see again the model of the throne that is in one of the Rome Museum. And you can see a model collected by, uh, the, with, together with the University of Rome 3 of the entire section of Aurelian Wall in Rome that is uh, near uh, San Sebastian Gate. Uh, as the diagnostic, I want to give you a feeling of the problem. These are uh, archaeological rests of uh, some Roman fresco found in a, in a ruined uh, villa. And the problem was to find out uh, which was going to, together with which of the same period, and to reconstruct possible some part of the wall. This, for this, we used all in situ all kind of spectroscopic technique, and we had to do data, data fusion. So here is an example of a, a spectroscopic analysis of uh, um, some color that were overlapped to find out the realization technique and even some mistake in the realization. And to solve this kind of problem, we used also um, statistic analysis and artificial intelligence, especially neural network analysis. 
Another example uh, carried out by our ICT col colleagues, so they used uh, a, a small scanner in situ uh, on archaeological area of the Museum Traiani. Um, and uh, uh, the fragment were fragments from Basilica Ulpia. And there was a frieze with some sphinx, a procession of sphinx. And we were asked to reconstruct from 14 fragments uh, one element of the sphinx. It was successful with the fusion of the data, with putting together the pieces, which were not from one single, but from a series of sphinx, so all slightly different. And the model was done, and the model was printed, as one of our uh, Korean uh, colleagues has shown. We have this printed uh, model that was useful, uh, for, used for um, an exhibition at the museum, and was also suitable for being touched by uh, people uh, which have problem of a correct sight. So it was a better fruition of the um, of the cultural heritage object. Um, I hope that in this short presentation, I gave you the feeling uh, of what can be done uh, when we have uh, uh, on one side uh, the data producer, which are developing instrument, dedicated instrument, and on the other side, the ICT that put on the platform. The two scenarios that we have considered in summary are the seismic scenario, uh, where we use uh, uh, the high resolution scanner for 3D documentation and even to get some element that could be used for a H beam protocol in large case of large, large building and the monitoring system on fiber optics. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, some uh, element can be reproduced and made vibrating to uh, understand the better solution for uh, preserving it and uh, possibly prevent uh, uh, destruction due to seismic event. The other side is uh, uh, the archaeologic scenario, which is quite important uh, in Italy. And in this case, we do uh, some uh, spectroscopic analysis uh, for material characterization. We try uh, a digital reconstruction, as also was shown in a previous uh, intervention. And when possible, uh, we use the artificial intelligence support. And uh, this is uh, just a feeling, but uh, uh, I think it gives an idea where you can get support for specific uh, topics from the NAI expertise. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Robert Fantoni, for your excellent presentation. And I would like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, let's welcome to the first year stage the second speaker of the session two. Dr. Eugene Jo from ICRO, South Korea, who will present the World Heritage Leadership Program, Improving Conservation and Management Practices for Culture and Nature Through Peer Learning Panorama Nature Culture Solutions. Eugene is the Program Manager of the IUCN ICRO World Heritage Leadership Program since 2017, based in Rome, Italy. WHL is a capacity building program aiming to improve management practices by interlinking culture and nature while taking a people-centered approach. Eugene, we are ready to listen to your excellent lecture. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening to everybody around the world listening to this symposium. And I would very much like to thank um, the organizers for inviting me to speak at this event, uh, which I must confess I might not be the most uh, distinguished <laughs> in terms of information technology. Um, just as a, a, a starting note to those of you who may not know ECROM, ECROM is an intergovernmental organization 
that is dedicated towards the protection and conservation of cultural heritage all around the world, uh, tangible, intangible, movable, and immovable. And uh, we are, uh, we currently uh, work with 137 different member states. And in particular, the area that we are most sort of known for is our work as the advisory body to the World Heritage Committee. So we are the capacity building organ of the World Heritage Convention, and therefore we deal with a lot of different sites, uh, both nature and culture, uh, facing management issues, conservation issues, um, uh, that we uh, try to uh, assist with uh, technical policy advice, but mostly through providing appropriate training and capacity building activities. And it is in this context that I actually participate in the symposium. And uh, I would just like to uh, preface by saying that perhaps what I would like to talk about in this instance is not so much about the technology aspects of our work, but really um, sort of raising provocations about what aspects we need the technological support in, uh, in managing different sites all around the world. So I may not have many different answers, but I, I do have lots of different questions that I may be able to pose through my presentation. And I hope that's okay. Um, as a background, the World Heritage Leadership Program is a, as, as explained, as a capacity building program, we're very much focused on providing training to uh, different site managers around the world, so actual practitioners who work on different sites. And it is jointly de delivered between ECROM and IUCN. Um, IUCN, as many of you may know, is one of the largest uh, environmental uh, bodies uh, uh, in the international arena and is also one of the advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee uh, overlooking aspects on natural heritage conservation and management. And uh, the entire program is very much delivered in coordination with ECOMOS, one of our other sister advisory bodies on cultural heritage and with the UNESCO World Heritage Center. Um, the program itself is funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment, and we have also activity funding support coming from Switzerland and Korea. The entire program is very much focused on identifying heritage as a more integrated and holistic entity. Uh, we're focused on promoting links between culture and nature, whereas in the past, we very much invested on the division of different types of heritage, whether it be cultural heritage, cultural landscapes, architecture, archaeology, or biodiversity, or geology. It's not so much to focus uh, on the different aspects that distinguish the heritage, but really focusing on managing the different sites and different places. And we need to do that by actually understanding where the heritage sits and in what kind of kind of environment that it sits in to be able to understand the different connections and interlinkages between the cultural and natural elements. And in order to do that, we also need to be very aware about the role of people and our effect that we have in terms of um, how it forms the heritage site, but how we affect in the management scheme of the heritage site. So uh, we cover a wide range of themes uh, regarding the management of world heritage, uh, effective management, um, talking about management as a whole, but also concentrating on resilience, which uh, focuses on disaster risk management, but also climate change adaptation, and also on conducting impact assessments for pending and uh, potential changes that may come about in heritage sites. Now, obviously, the context that we work in is on focused on world heritage, but at the same time, the different ideas and approaches that we do promote through our programs can be applied to all different heritage sites um, that are around the world, whether it be national, local, or regional. The program itself was conceived on the premise that heritage is facing global threats and risks wherever they are in the world, uh, whether it be of climate change, of development, and uh, that the heritage community were not quite so well prepared to address these large scale changes that actually happen beyond the uh, scope of the designated heritage sites. We've very much been um, 
dominated by the idea that uh, heritage is more of a limited scope of a size um, and uh, with completely designated boundaries, uh, with walls perhaps, where heritage has been an island that we need to defend and protect at all costs. But uh, in looking at various different key issues for which World Heritage property enter into reactive monitoring processes or danger listing, it's very clear that the problems of isolating heritage from other parts of society actually penalizes the heritage rather than protects it. And it's an acute problem because we're very uh, unaware of the different factors that actually affect the management of sites that come from beyond the confines of the site. And site managers who are responsible for managing these sites, however uh, well-intentioned and uh, well-equipped, they have very limited capacity to forge change um, beyond the actual designated boundaries of the site itself. And therefore, we are uh, more focused and very much invested in promoting the whole idea of uh, understanding the management system uh, as a much more holistic unity of different elements coming together that would be very much based on the specificities of the heritage place itself. Here you see the diagram of a uh, World Heritage Management System and where you can see that based on the different specificities of the heritage place, we then need to talk about different governance arrangements. We then need to talk about how we set out different strategic directions and processes um, and implement management that would then uh, ultimately lead us to different types of results, results such as conserving the heritage uh, first and foremost, but then also being able to uh, obtain wider sustainable development results uh, and uh, and in, uh, in a reiterative uh, cycle to be able to improve the management system as a whole. This is very much uh, focused on understanding the heritage place. And here you'll see the different elements that we have sort of uh, identified as those crucial elements that we need, absolutely need to form the baseline of understanding a heritage place. And whereas in the past, we've been very much invested in just identifying the fixed boundaries of a designated site and understanding what are the different elements within it, it goes beyond that. It needs to be about the significance. It needs to be about the values, why this place is considered important, with whom, who actually holds those values, who are the people and communities that are connected to those values and attributes and the different types of services and benefits that these heritage sites provide to the wider society. And in order to do that, we need to understand the different social environment and economic context that the sites sit in. And from that, we'll be able to also tease out various different factors and the, uh, the possible threats that uh, could affect the heritage. And uh, it is in these elements, it, it is on these uh, and the understanding of the entire heritage place upon which then we can actually construct a much more healthy management system and be able to succeed in our interventions of our management actions. So that it's, it's, to under, it's actually to adopt a focus to say that we understand that change will happen. We will not be able to freeze the heritage in any way, but we just need to know um, the context that we're operating in and we need much more data in order to do that. And uh, the more the data that we can collect about the surrounding environment and the underlying context of where the heritage place is, it would give us much more capabilities of reacting of proactively responding to uh, disaster risk management, of adapting to climate change, but also in terms of reacting to different types of development happening around the heritage site. And uh, this is very much to also emphasize that disaster risk management, although needing focused attention and perhaps dedicated um, actions that would follow specifically the different uh, hazards and vulnerabilities, we also need to be aware that these actions need to be embedded into the overarching 
day-to-day -day management of heritage sites and that the two cannot be separated out. So looking at recent numbers, we're very much aware that climate change related disasters around the world are increasingly um, very heavily and that unless we are actually able to identify methods of uh, understanding the interconnectivity of climate change issues to the exasperated uh, events of disasters, we'll, we won't be able to uh, be able to respond to them proactively in our overarching management plans and actions of heritage. And this goes hand in hand with um, uh, the different areas of work that we're undertaking with impact assessments, where even though in a different context of having a manageable change, let's say, of human induced change of development, it still um, forces us to have a much better understanding of the context that we're operating in, why this project is needed, and what kind of social uh, impacts and different types of uh, circumstances actually force us to uh, adopting these changes in development, because these changes can also be uh, triggered by climate change impacts. So we may be re installing renewable energy facilities in order to combat climate change, but is that actually absolutely necessary in the context of protecting this particular site? These, all these questions need to come into play. So um, the program is actually twofold, where we have a um, one set of uh, activities that actually focuses on content creation. And this is generally talking about different management manuals, uh, different sets of guidances, toolkits that we can uh, apply directly to heritage sites, and also collecting different case studies around the world that would actually promote the use of these management approaches. And uh, it's not just about compiling content and uh, uh, producing different written material, but it's also about conducting different courses and activities that would actually give different people a chance to be exposed to these content and give them a uh, direct hands-on uh, opportunity to apply these to different contexts. Now, um, these are the main uh, outputs that we are working towards, and uh, two of them, uh, the ones at the bottom, um, Enhancing Our Heritage Toolkit, which is a management effectiveness assessment toolkit, and the uh, guidance document on imp conducting impact assessments will be produced within this year. And uh, we're very much facing the issue that, uh, whereas the collection of data in terms of uh, managing the data sources that we can collect from the immediate uh, conservation status of heritage sites has vastly improved from the past. It's still not very possible for us to really document management actions and processes um, that, can, uh, that can be applicable to site managers in adopting these different methodologies. It's very difficult to uh, collect data and empirical evidence of um, that would prove that adopting a certain type of management action or a management approach is actually going to directly impact the conservation status of a heritage site, which we uh, find as one of our biggest gaps of trying to promote different ways of working. So we're very much invested in uh, coming up with different concepts of tools and methods to improve the working processes and bridging the gaps between nature and culture and also putting back into places the role of people and communities. And uh, we're very much invested in talking about different decision-making processes and talking about governance structures, which again also um, applies to many different instances uh, of heritage management that goes undocumented, let's say. Um, the methodology of the program is learning by doing, and rather than um, emphasizing that there is one way to do a certain thing, it's all about understanding the different context and the different legal systems that many different sites are facing and their composition of people and resources that they have. And therefore, we try to strive on the process of providing various different um, uh, solutions 
um, that people can uh, learn from and adapt accordingly to their own situations. We also have the possibility of engaging directly with various different site managers all over the world. This is a, uh, an example of a site managers forum that we recently conducted in conjunction with the uh, most recent World Heritage Committee meeting, where we connected over 90 people from all over the world to talk about different management approaches and methodologies that can be applied to different sites. So it's, much, uh, it's, it's very much a platform where we can promote different tools, different ways of management. But uh, in question, I, I had put as a subtitle, the Panorama platform. This is one of our platforms that we are using to showcase different case studies. We know that case studies, um, often called also best practices, are very useful for people to relate and actually be able to understand what goes on um, in different sites and be able to adapt it to their own case to their own sites themselves. The only problem is once we start to call them best practice, it only um, captures the successful case studies, whereas uh, we believe that uh, there is so much to learn from failures as well, because that's where uh, the direct lessons come from. And we have various different pilot case studies documenting uh, management practices all over the world um, that is hosted on the Panorama platform, um, which for which you can see the uh, link uh, provided in the slide that is being currently coordinated together by ECROM, ECOMOS and IUCN, where we host different nature culture solutions, where we see uh, a lot of different sites that are adopting interlinkages between nature and culture that is actually helping site management in different ways. And the policy is to make sure that we don't necessarily divide between uh, these nature culture um, uh, concepts and that we actually put back into place the role of people and what kind of uh, responsibilities that they can have uh, through these uh, case studies. And it's to document the ongoing practices on the ground so that it can be shareable and it can be adaptable to different sites. We, uh, the Panorama platform actually has, uh, is set up with a, uh, a filter system, a tagging system, where you can browse through uh, more than 900 different case studies that branch out, not just nature culture solutions, but through different thematic communities such as marine, um, underwater, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem approaches, so on and so forth, where we're able to actually identify similar types of issues that many different heritage sites may face and be able to narrow down different case studies uh, that would be helpful for my particular case. It's a platform that connects through the different people involved in heritage management where uh, we have a solution provider, a person who is documenting their own practice, and then through the use of the platform, um, solution seekers, people who are seeking for different ways and different uh, methodologies may actually reach and come down to reading the solution and be able to use it. Now it does go through a review process in the middle and to be able to make sure that it's not just about documenting um, the result of the success, we, uh, the Panorama platform actually adopts a, uh, a system called the building block where the solution provider actually needs to document what are the aspects that work for their site and if those aspects are actually replicable in other sites as well as a methodology. And therefore, if you can, um, the, the building blocks coming all together would make up the case study and that would, it, it is through the building blocks that the people seeking solutions would be able to come and find relevant case studies that would uh, apply to them. And uh, it's, a, it's a working platform that has access to many different multimedia files and uh, also recognizing who is contributing to these solutions. So identifying the responsible authorities and being able to name the sites and sources of these management practices and to be able to make sure that the credibility of the information sources are maintained uh, together with copyright and data protection. So um, this is one of the um, examples of the building blocks that I've been explaining. And uh, to uh, 
tease out enabling factors, different lessons learned, and uh, a possible uh, gallery with lots of different uh, photographs. So these are, um, this is just a, a, a quick introduction to the Panorama platform that uh, we're operating and working together with, with many different heritage practitioners. And uh, these are all uh, possible to track through the use of different filters and tags that I explained, and they're all retrofitted to fit the different themes that you're looking for and the challenges. But then um, we find it very difficult to actually promotes the ideas of how much uh, how much of a result, how much of a, of a, a good conclusion that we can draw out from these management interventions. And uh, it's very difficult to capture those data that uh, would document the processes as well as the results. And uh, therefore, we're very much going through a learning by doing in order to build up this uh, platform to document those methodologies and approaches um, uh, that would further strengthen the gaps uh, between existing between researchers and site managers in trying to use various different tools and their various different technology that is being developed on the ground. So um, this is just to, uh, as a concluding note, uh, the Panorama Nature Culture uh, is becoming a research database where there can be new ideas being promoted um, and uh, becoming a learning tool for different heritage researchers and practitioners. Um, but it's, it's very difficult for us to actually create tools for evaluating and analyzing the data. And uh, it's also very difficult to capture indigenous and local knowledge that are not necessarily, that have not been necessarily considered to be part of the scientific data. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a continuous challenge for us to be able to maintain the credibility and uh, be able to make this into a useful platform and, an, and, a, and a living platform between different people of practice. So uh, based on these challenges, we're trying to uh, start up a new pilot phase uh, pro project of a heritage place lab where we've identified that there are many different management issues that many different countries and sites face that may look different, but actually are very similar in their origin. And uh, by linking through these different sites and researchers, we're hoping to come up with a common research agenda that would be able to fill in the gaps existing regarding practical um, management actions and theoretical research. So um, with this, I would just like to close uh, my presentation and just uh, pose a question, let's say, and, and uh, uh, provocation to, to be able to have the possibility of using uh, better information technology um, sort of resources to be able to document management actions and interventions in the future. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene, uh, for, for the gr great presentation and for this uh, question. Uh, I think uh, you brought uh, to, to this uh, forum, to this symposium, two very important concepts. Uh, one is about uh, uh, the holistic view of heritage place that is not just a physical place, but has intangible values and attributes. I think uh, uh, ICT technology should uh, help also there to try to capture those. And these other uh, about uh, management uh, best practices. Uh, and also failures uh, that uh, I totally agree with you should be documented. So thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm sure everybody <laughs> will be in contact with you. And uh, now uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage of this symposium, our last but uh, uh, absolutely not least, uh, uh, least speaker, which is uh, Dr. Giovanni De Siervo. Uh, Dr. Giovanni De Siervo is cur currently is coordinating the humanitarian aid and disaster risk management activities at the Civil Protection Department under the presidency of the Council of Ministers in Italy. He acted as a director of the International Relations and Activities Unit for several years in the Civil Protection Department. And now also is a project director of a very ambitious and successful project that is Procultair Pro Initiative. So uh, Dr. Giovanni De Siervo will present about the Procultair Initiative significant steps towards 
includes building European operational capacity within the union, union civil protection mechanism to increase the protection of cultural heritage. Dr. De Siervo, uh, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for this great overview. Thank you very much for the presentation, uh, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, my presentation will be a bit different from the one you have followed so far because I won't touch too much on ICT, but I will uh, look at the at protection of cultural heritage from a slightly different perspective. Uh, on one hand, I would uh, consider that I will discuss as a, an end user, if I may call it. On the other hand, at the same time, I will be uh, presenting what uh, the um, um, let's say the, the national authorities are doing to, to protect cultural heritage in case of major disasters. Uh, very quickly, this ProCulture initiative is a project funded by the European uh, Commission uh, and uh, it's uh, managed by a consortium uh, guided by the Italian Civil Protection Department and the other partners are uh, the uh, direction, uh, the general director for the Sécurité Civile and Gestion des Crises of France, uh, the region of uh, uh, Castilla y Leon from Spain, the civil protection national authorities from Turkey, and then uh, we also have uh, uh, the pleasure to cooperate with ICROM and the Centro Studi Bella Montesca Foundation. Uh, we also received the support from the endorsement and support from UNESCO for, for Europe. Uh, what is it and uh, how, why we are, uh, as a civil protection authorities, dealing directly with cultural language? Uh, first and foremost, we need to clarify that uh, we, I need to inform you that in Europe, the European Union has uh, developed along the, 20, the last 20 years what is called the EU Civil Protection Mechanism, the European Union Civil Protection Mechanism, which is the, a kind of uh, could be a network of the civil protection authorities of the 27 member states of the European Union, plus six additional participating states, Norway, uh, the former Yugoslav Republic, North Macedonia, sorry, uh, Montenegro, Serbia, uh, Iceland, and Turkey. This a uh, network of civil protection authorities has been established in 2001 and in the last 20 years it was activated over 350 times uh, for requesting uh, assistance by a affected countries after a disaster to receive support from all the other uh, no, from uh, the the, 20, uh, the 33 countries i mentioned before which have decided to work in a coordinated manner in case of emergencies. So th this mechanism was and is activated for uh, earthquakes, flooding, any type of disaster, forest fires, uh, or many other uh, type of disasters. And it, it, we know uh, the, the countries part of those of these mechanisms are providing specialized support coming from their national capabilities. Uh, to support the affected countries to solve uh, the, the problems caused by the disasters. Uh, if you think, if I have to make an example of what is the typical uh, operation of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, uh, I would say you can imagine after a, an earthquake, the request of uh, urban search and rescue teams, the firefighters going to look for people, for example. This is the typical example of assistance that can be provided by this mechanism. Uh, but it, along the years, building on the great success of this tool, uh, on the so-called traditional type of uh, responses like the urban search and rescue I just mentioned, uh, it, was, uh, it emerged the, the, the need to do something more than uh, concentrating on the traditional type of assistance that can be requested in case of disasters. And one of those uh, that came from an initiative, uh, from on the initiative of the Italian Civil Protection Department is also that a country affected by a disaster might be on need of receiving a support specialized on uh, cultural heritage protection. 
uh, as you heard today, as you know very well, Italy has a long history of disasters and it has a long history also of uh, responding to disaster, especially with cultural heritage, because for our country, cultural heritage is so present, so important that we were forced along the years to develop a cap capabilities uh, that are that can be used in, in the aftermath of a disaster. So, building on this idea, we propose to create uh, a first project uh, in trying to to see how we could put at the disposal of other countries our experience. And uh, uh, France, Turkey and Spain decided, to, to, together with ICROM, to, to join us on this uh, path. And uh, we also uh, were ambitious enough to say, OK, let's try to put, uh, set up the basis for operational, uh, common basis at European level for uh, operational um, response in case of uh, uh, damages to cultural heritage. So we said that we had the ambition to, we have the ambition of setting the base to create a, a joint methodology and identifying also some uh, common tools at European level that can, could be uh, used as a reference for all countries of the European uh, Union and not only. So, uh, how to do that? The idea was uh, starting from the, uh, the lessons learned. I enjoy, uh, I like very much the definition of the uh, speaker uh, that was spoke before me when uh, she said that uh, we don't have only to, to build on, on, on uh, good practices, but also on failure. I fully endorse this uh, definition. I think we have started exactly to identify a common uh, line of uh, uh, and uh, common, um, let's say, methodology building on failure and successes that were reached at the level at the national level in the different countries that participated to this project. Uh, so we uh, uh, have been working in the last two years uh, uh, on, on uh, identifying uh, the method. Uh, the basic for a European methodology on uh, uh, responding to disaster uh, on culture, affecting cultural heritage. We uh, have, uh, of course, worked a lot on outreach. And one of the very important objective of uh, uh, our project is also to define the possibility of uh, uh, um, creating the term of reference for a, a team composed of personnel and equipment uh, that could be put at the disposal of the Union civil the European Union civil protection mechanism to intervene in support to any country in the world that would need support for cultural heritage protection in case of disaster under the umbrella of the uh, European Union mechanism. So, uh, as I said, we start. We started from the available experience uh, in the different countries involved in the project, and we tried to identify a common European methodologies and also to identify tools that have been developed along the years in Europe uh, for uh, cultural heritage protection. Uh, we, at the same time, we are trying to uh, promote. Uh, uh, you know, uh, an innovative approach to the uh, cultural heritage protection in the field of civil protection. Uh, you know, too often uh, the, these two uh, words, um, the civil protection disaster management, if we want to call it, uh, if, because this is more global as uh, the, the understanding of disaster management agencies, or, or, uh, in Italy it's called civil protection. Um, the, the, this world of civil protection and the world of cultural heritage protection are moving as pillar, as a silos. They do not communicate to each other. We started uh, building on, on the Italian experience and also on the other partners' experience on the need to have a contamination between these two worlds. We cannot work as silos. We need to work jointly. 
uh, on the one hand, the disaster management, on the other hand, the cultural heritage specialist. For the, uh, uh, based on this assumption, we also are developing, as I said before, the uh, interdisciplinary multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral team of people and equipment to be uh, deployed in case of emergency at the request on a, of an affected state. Um, so this is the, the, let's say, the time frame of our project. Uh, this project, of course, had a bit of a delay due to the uh, pandemic, uh, so it was extended for, for one year, and it will end at the end of this year. Sorry. Um, okay. The, 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 one of the ambitions of this project is also to extend the, the, the endorsement, to have more and more countries at the European level endorsing this uh, this methodology and uh, of course it's not a, a fixed methodology for us as I said before it's like really the baseline it is the uh, basic that can be we hope it will be endorsed and further developed by the contribution of all the other countries that might be uh, interested of having such a, uh, an interest for the future so, um, what are the main findings? What we have identified so far or, or, on the uh, main, um, as basics uh, for creating the identifying a European methodology uh, for protecting cultural heritage in case of disaster. First, we uh, there, there is a lot of experience out uh, out there in all the even country we have worked. We have identified new ideas and new uh, or um, new methodology new methodologies that can be of interest of many other countries. We have to work, as I said before, on a. Uh, structure co cooperation and collaboration between cultural and civil protection actors, both at the national and international level, because I mentioned, uh, and of course our project is focused at the European level, but the same thing we have identified, and ICROM knows it very well, that also at the United Nations level, if we look from the perspective of the disaster management, uh, the 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 the, uh, the two set, the two kind of actors, civil protection and cultural heritage, are moving uh, in the silos also at the UN level. And uh, luckily, in recent years, there were very important uh, steps to uh, have this more structured collaboration also at the United Nations level. And then, of course, we are working on a participatory approach and we are trying to involve uh, relevant stakeholders from all different uh, interested countries. One very important element is that uh, together with the methodology, we are at the same time developing a uh, uh, training and exercise uh, program that will, let's say, help us later on to uh, share uh, these ideas and these methodologies with all interested stakeholders. So, uh, since I'm running out of time, I will be very quick, but uh, as I said already, uh, we are working, working at the two levels, international level, working on based on uh, creating synergies among civil protection and cultural heritage actors. We have, um, let's say, developing standard operating procedures, the basic standard operating procedures that we hope it will be developed further by the contribution on many of other actors. We are also working on preparedness, developing tra dedicated training standards and uh, also uh, exercises. And we are, and that's what we hope to be able to finalize by the end of this year, also creating the, uh, the term of reference and standard operating procedure of uh, a team of experts and uh, uh, also equipment to be, uh, that could be replicated in all European countries to be able to 
be deployed, able to be deployed in the aftermath of the disaster of a disasters. Uh, this is what we are doing at international level. But of course, to reach this level, uh, uh, to have, we need to build understanding and uh, uh, knowledge at the national level. So we encourage all different uh, countries at the European level to work uh, at the national level on the government governance of uh, uh, protecting cultural heritage in time of the disaster. Uh, building strong synergies between the disaster managers and the uh, ministry in charge of cultural heritage protection. We are uh, encouraging member states to uh, develop um, tools and procedures uh, and, and of course, and this is linked also to the topic of the today's meeting, uh, the, um, technologies that could be of help dedicated to, this, uh, to the protection of cultural heritage in a uh, time of disasters. Uh, like we do at the international level, we are working defining, uh, we, we encourage the member states uh, that are interested to, to, this, to the outcome of the, our project to develop, uh, to work on preparedness, so on training and exercising dedicated for cultural heritage. Uh, protection and of course also to in, case, in time of disasters every interested country has to have its own uh, team or uh, or at least a, um, a mechanism to respond uh, to the, no to, to protect cultural heritage after a disaster at national level um, we have also worked we are working in our reach we have uh, uh, organized recently an international workshop you know, with this topic where we, we, we try to share with some of uh, the, the stakeholders of the sector the key findings of our methodology. And we have received so far very interesting feedbacks and we will try to incorporate them in the final methodology that we have currently developing. Uh, I uh, leave with you the uh, links for of, uh, our project. So, if you want to be more, uh, to want to receive more information, of course, you can contact myself or the, uh, you can follow us on the social media. And just for your information, uh, we have received so uh, a lot of attention by our stakeholders at the European level, and we have decided to not to stop here, but to continue to further uh, develop our, um, our methodology and to go beyond uh, this, uh, this idea. Uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, already got approved a new project uh, that will be funded by the European Union Civil Protection Mechanism uh, for the future, which will be called ProCulturNet, which aim at aims at uh, creating a stronger, more stable network of all actors coming from the two uh, sectors, civil protection and uh, cultural heritage protection world, uh, willing to further develop, let's say, uh, these uh, all the tools and methodologies linked to the protection of cultural heritage from the consequence of disasters. This project is not uh, started, has not started yet. It will be uh, probably, will start probably at the beginning of next year. And uh, we will share with you, uh, with all interested stakeholders, the information that we have so far. Thank you. for this uh, very interesting presentation and really uh, I wish this goes uh, beyond uh, uh, Europe uh, so at world, uh, world uh, wide level and for sure from uh, our side we can connect uh, through ATRI and NUCH uh, the uh, Civil Protection Department of Korea uh, with you so I think that that could be a first uh, uh, first step uh, to contribute toward uh, this uh, interesting uh, initiative, a very, very important actually. Okay, so uh, 
I think it's time to close this uh, very, I hope, successful and interesting symposium. Uh, I'm very glad to have uh, Sang Hyun Lee representing Atrium, that uh, is the main organization uh, uh, organizing this symposium. And we are waiting on this same space, uh, the representative for the other organizations uh, that uh, have uh, contributed to, uh, to, to this symposium, which are Fraunhofer and, uh, and uh, Nuch University. So in the meanwhile, uh, I would like to thank uh, very much all the presenters uh, and all the presidents uh, that uh, have uh, provided their interesting uh, speeches uh, uh, during this symposium today. So for uh, in the first session, we saw uh, a great uh, uh, overview of very advanced IT ICT technologies that are applied for heritage uh, conservation and restoration. We saw uh, uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence, uh, laser scanning uh, for uh, going into H beam model and uh, uh, monitoring system, very advanced monitoring system and uh, vulnerability assessment. We learned in the second session that uh, uh, cultural heritage and is not only about the physical aspect uh, which uh, absolutely are very important uh, to to preserve so cultural heritage is also intangible values uh, and uh, uh, we heard uh, a call for uh, action on uh, developing ICT technologies for supporting this uh, um, data collection data processing and analysis of these intangible aspect and values that can somehow promote uh, you know the, the resilience of uh, cultural heritage as well as in this last uh, uh, intervention from uh, we heard that, that uh, absolutely we should move uh, as a multi uh, organization multi stakeholder and multi uh, disciplinary approach so all these uh, aspects uh, will be discussed uh, for sure in the uh, next symposium that we hope to organize uh, uh, next year and for sure as uh, Maya uh, Kim was uh, wishing mm, in the opening session we hope uh, to have the possibility to see each other in person in March uh, uh, here in Italy um, for uh, for a further uh, Etri and uh, whoever has organization who is interested to join us meeting. So I leave uh, uh, to Dr. Sang Hyun Lee for his uh, uh, remarks and, and greetings and see if, yeah. Thank you, Sonia, for uh, preparing today's symposium. Mm. Uh, this is the uh, first time for me to hold a symposium uh, through a YouTube live broadcast. I would like to thank you, the ANIA events team, for their support in making the events a success. I would, like, I, uh, I would also like to thank you, all the experts who gave excellent lectures through this event. Also, I would like to thank Sonia of Enya, uh, Professor Yu of Nucci, and Daniel of Fraunhofer, who have prepared today's event with me uh, from the beginning. Thank you to everyone around the world who watched today's event until the end. I look for, forward to continuing to exchange information through this symposium in the future, and I hope we can meet again in Rome next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sang Yung, for uh, and also for uh, mentioning and thanking again uh, the other organizing of this symposium. Uh, unfortunately, probably they will not be able uh, to to join us. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, in uh, this closure, also all the NEA staff uh, uh, that uh, supported uh, this uh, broadcasting uh, and uh, all the organization of the symposium, in particular, Sonia Pirazzi and Cristina Sanna and all the team. So uh, again, uh, thank you to all the attendees uh, and uh, see you next year for the third uh, symposium, International Symposium.